Hi, I'm Carl Azus, and you're watching CNN 10, 10 minutes of news explained. There are a lot of fast moving political headlines from the United States right now. On Wednesday, the White House is expected to release the transcript of a phone call, a conversation between the presidents of the United States and Ukraine. The circumstances surrounding that call and something allegedly discussed on it were the reasons why, on Tuesday, Democrats from the U.S. House of Representatives announced they were moving forward on an impeachment inquiry, an investigation into whether U.S. President Donald Trump committed a crime. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says he did, calling the president's actions a, quote, betrayal of his oath of office. The president called the announcement, quote, more breaking news, witch hunt garbage. There's a lot of info to explain here, from the forthcoming transcript of the president's phone call with Ukraine's leader to accusations from Democratic leaders about what the president's actions were after the call. More details were coming in as we put this show together, and we'll have a down-the-middle report on all of it tomorrow on CNN 10. While all of that was going on, the White House says the president was working hard on behalf of the U.S. in New York City. That's where he addressed the United Nations General Assembly yesterday. It's a gathering of representatives from all 193 countries that are members of the U.N. It's the United Nations, meeting place for most of the world's countries, from the most powerful such as the United States, China and Russia, to the smallest and most vulnerable. For 68 years, the UN has been involved in everything from assisting refugees to negotiating peace among nations. Of all the languages in the world, the UN uses six to communicate. El Arabia, Chongwen, English, Francais, Ruski, and Espanol. In some combination of those six, the UN deliberates on global issues. For judicial matters, they look to the International Court of Justice. The Economic and Social Council, otherwise known as ECOSOC, deals with, you guessed it, the world's economic, social, and environmental issues. The Trusteeship Council helps countries become self-governed and independent, while the Secretariat, another part of the UN family, tackles day-to-day -day issues that include keeping the press informed. Where I'm standing is one of the more recognizable places in the UN, the Security Council. It determines threats to international peace and works to solve those problems right here in this chamber, a gift from Norway in 1952. And on top of that, this council selects the Secretary General, who is then formally appointed by the General Assembly, the main representative body of the UN. The GA, as it's called, meets from September to December every year, but the world's problems don't exactly follow the calendar. The UN has to operate year-round, and one of the ways they're staying current is through social media. And you can follow the organization in any of its official languages. 10-second trivia. Which of these countries shares part of the island of Borneo with Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, or Thailand? Borneo is divided between three countries, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. It is truly a surreal looking landscape with everything washed in red. Even though this looks like this video might have been recorded on Mars, it's from part of Indonesia. Not Borneo, but an Indonesian province across the Java Sea from it, where haze from forest fires is turning this landscape red. The nation's government says this can happen when tiny particles of pollution scatter the sunlight during the day. And it's not a good idea to be outside in it, as air quality monitors say it can cause serious health problems. One of the people who recorded this video says it stung the eyes and the throat. The smog has spread to nearby Malaysia and Singapore. Indonesian police say most of the fires that trigger this are set by people who are using the slash and burn methods of clearing farmland in the dry summer months. It's been going on for decades, though it's officially illegal. Here's a change of pace. If you've ever looked at your dog and asked, what are you thinking? There's a team of scientists at a private university in Georgia who are using magnetic resonance imaging, MRI technology, to try to discover just that. Of course, that involves putting the animals into an MRI machine, and that requires a bit of training. Give me a hug. Give me a hug. Yes, I know. Okay. Want to do some training? I work with dogs to train them to go into an MRI scanner and try to figure out what makes them tick and what they're thinking.
My name is Gregory Burns. I'm a neuroscientist at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I've grown up with dogs and I've lived with dogs pretty much my whole life. One of my favorite dogs had passed away. In the back of my mind, I started wondering, did that dog love me in the way that I loved him? And that was really the beginning of it. All of these basic things that we've begun to sort out in humans, at least in human brains, we want to do in dogs. If dogs can be trained to go into an MRI machine, then maybe we could figure out what they're actually thinking. So we have a dog in the scanner, that's Katie, and she is a veteran of the project. This is probably about the 15th time she's done this. Just having the idea of, okay, well, let's train dogs to go on the scanner, it wasn't immediately apparent how you would go about doing that. And, and MRI scanners are not the most pleasant environments. Okay, hey, Cal, Coil. Good girl. Callie is the little black terrier who was the first dog to train for the dog project. High five. I built a simulator of an MRI. So this is the simulator that I built here in my basement. Then we started adding in recordings of the scanner noise, which is actually quite loud. We just started working with you know, treats and positive reinforcement to see if we could get her to go into this thing. That actually proved to be pretty easy. And then so what we did was we kind of put out word of mouth, do you want to join this project? Do you want to train your dogs for an MRI and you know, maybe figure out what they're thinking? The purpose of this is to go through a number of exercises, including basic obedience, as well as how they react to the obstacles. When we hold the tryouts, it lets us weed out the dogs that we don't think would enjoy doing this. One of the benefits then of having more participants is it gives you statistical power. You can start to average dogs' brains together and get a better sense for what's happening. I started wondering very seriously if we could really finally answer this question. Do dogs essentially like us just for the social bond and not about the food? And what we found was looking at the reward system that almost all the dogs had equal responses both to food as well as praise. And even a few dogs like the praise more. The things that we were finding about the dog's brain in many ways confirm, I think, what people know in their hearts about how dogs behave and why they behave. And the way I think about dogs is in many ways they're the ambassadors to the animal world. They're not that different from many of the other mammals out there, and so I suspect that a lot of what we find in dogs probably holds true for pretty much any mammal. The eBay description alone is a 10 out of 10. 15-ton, two-story tall, gasoline-powered, car-smashing, piloted giant battle robot. It's used and has dents and dings from robot combat. It cost two and a half million dollars to build and was listed for only a dollar, though bidding was at more than $50,000 last night. Now the downsides. It'll probably cost 2,500 bucks in gas, repairs, and maintenance every time you use it. It needs new treads. Shipping ain't free, and the company that made it is bankrupt, so no returns. You'll need a machine works to ensure the machine works. You'll need some mega bucks to buy the mega bot. But for robot fans, it's a sight for sore mechan eyes. It puts the fun in functional, can yield tons of it, powering up a hydraulic in good time, at least until you have to repair to a shop, because if you robot it, you robot it, and its service will be limited when it needs it. I'm Carl Azus, and that is CNN Tech. <laughs>